Are you a high school student, a parent, or maybe an adult learner and wondering how to apply to college? What are all the steps that you need to take in this video? That's exactly what we're going to talk about. My name is Brooke and I've been coaching students through the college admissions process as well as SAT and ACT preparation for almost 20 years. You can find more about what our company does at supertutortv.com. We've got a couple of courses for the ACT and the SAT that can prepare you for those exams. We also have private consultants and essay coaches to help you through the entire college admissions process. So if you're looking for any support, be sure to check that out. So the first step in applying to college is to make sure that you take the right classes. Now, the majority of students that I work with, it's really not a concern whether they take the right classes because I work with a lot of overachievers and most of them are taking four years of math, four years of science, four years of English, four years of foreign language, and four years of social studies. If you take four of everything, you're pretty much covered. But I realized that not all high schools require that for graduation and not all schools require that many academic courses. So it's important for you to make sure that you take what you need to take. And if you're not aiming for Harvard or Stanford, where, for example, Harvard says the ideal candidate will have four years of English, four years of math, four years of a foreign language in a single language, four years of science in biochem and physics, and then a fourth class that is a repeat of one of those subjects at a higher level, as well as three years of history. That's kind of the high bar. But other colleges and universities don't have recommendations or requirements that are that high. The other thing is if it's just a recommendation, you don't have to freak out if you took AP environmental science and Harvard is saying they want AP bio. It's probably fine. That's ideal. It doesn't mean you're disqualified. So if you're a senior and you're like, oh my God, it's too late, don't freak out. But if you don't have some of the core courses, for example, if you don't have four years of English, that's something you probably need to remedy with summer school or whatever other options you might have. In California, I'll just give you a counterpoint. In California, for the University of California system where I'm located, the bar is a little bit lower, but still make sure that you have at least the classes required by your state flagship. That's kind of my general rule of thumb for most high school students. And if you're an overachiever, again, I already went through that list. So at UCs, you need two years of history, four years of English, three years of math, two years of science, two years of foreign language, one year of arts, and an elective. You can find out more about that on the UC's website. And again, whatever state you're in, that's where I would look at your state university system and see what those minimum requirements are. If you do wanna to go to college, the state universities tend to be more strict about requirements than private universities. So make sure that you fulfill those requirements so you are ready to apply and get in. Number two, the second thing to think about on your getting into college checklist is to determine what do you want out of college. One of the top things to figure out when you're trying to determine what you want out of college is what major do you want to pursue? I recommend even as early as freshman year, you start exploring what majors you're interested in and also what careers you're interested in and then backtrack and figure out what majors go with those. Additionally, you wanna start thinking about what you want out of a college. Do you wanna go close to home? Do you want a big college? Do you want a small college? What kind of reputation are you seeking? What cost can your parents or you afford? What kind of rigor? would you like to have? Do you want to go to a rigorous college or do you want to have a really good time in college? What are your goals? Also community and fit and things like that. As you start to think of these things, that will help you determine whether colleges are right for you when you get into the full-blown college search. Step three, I want you to take the SAT or the ACT and generally, you can start off by taking the PSAT or the pre-ACT to kind of see where you're at score-wise, but you need to plan for and take standardized tests and if you're in AP and IB classes, make sure that you sign up for and take the related exams for those as well. Though I would say 80% of top 200 ranked colleges in the US are what we would call test optional or test blind. There's an increasing number of top schools that have begun to require SAT or ACT scores, or in some cases, AP or IB scores, alternatively to SAT and ACT scores. In any case, as we see those numbers start to increase, if you are aiming for a competitive university or if you live in a state like Georgia or Florida where in-state universities are requiring tests, you wanna make sure that you have your tests taken care of. I also recommend for almost all students applying to college to take the SAT or the ACT because these tests can help improve your profile overall, even at test optional schools, which are the majority of schools right now. Over 70% of colleges and universities are test optional, not test blind. There's only a small fraction of schools that are test blind. 
right? Maybe less than 10% of top 200 ranked colleges are test blind. So most colleges are going to give you credit if you take a test and you do well, and it's a way that you can stand out. So I recommend you at least try it, you at least take it. And two, many colleges and universities offer scholarships to students who hit a particular benchmark on the ACT or the SAT. In Louisiana, for example, you can auto-trigger scholarships even if you get a score as low as a 21. And so studying for this test, maybe 40 or 80 hours of your life, could amount to tens of thousands of dollars in some cases. You can obviously do the research particular to your circumstance or your location, but universally for all students, I recommend that you take the SAT or the ACT and prep for it so that you increase your odds of getting in, of getting scholarships, of getting into honors programs, and all the rest. Even UCs will let you use SAT English scores to pass out of particular English courses, right? You can get placed into an upper level course and get rid of a particular course requirement. So they're useful. Do not throw them in the trash. Take them and they can help you in this process. Fourth step is to discover colleges and make a college list. I recommend that students who are sophomores and juniors start to begin this process. How do you discover colleges? College fairs, college visits, college websites. All of that mail you get from the PSAT if you checked that box, the college search service. You can also get a book of colleges. I read the Fisk Guide to Colleges probably cover to cover and read about 400 different universities all around the United States, which I think was really helpful and informative to help me narrow down what kind of colleges I might be interested in. The other thing you can do is talk to people you know. Where have they gone to college? What has been their experience? And what kind of a college experience are you looking for? When you make your list, I recommend that almost all students universally have at least five colleges on their list, two safeties, two fits, and one reach at minimum. What is a safety? What is a reach? I call a safety a place with a 50% plus admit rate where your metrics are at the 75th percentile or above, meaning your GPA and your test score are at the 75th percentile or above on whatever chart they've released publicly. For FITS, I recommend you find schools with a 30% or greater admit rate and you should be at the 50th percentile in terms of GPA and if applicable test scores. Finally, a reach is a school where you're at least at the 25th percentile for grades and test scores, and it can have any range of admission rate. If you are applying to schools that are extremely competitive, top 20, even top 50 schools, almost every top 20 school that I know of at this point has admission rates that are below 20%. So what that means is they are all reaches. If you're applying to schools in that range and you have a shot at getting into one, that's when I start to say maybe you wanna add more schools to your college application list because essentially some of it is going to come down to luck. A lot of times I work with students applying to top 20 colleges and I say to them, I think you have what it takes to get into a top 20 school. You'll probably get into three or four, but I can't tell you which ones, which means you've got to apply to 12 of them to get those three or four admissions, right? So make sure that you expand your options if you're applying to competitive schools. Likewise, if you're applying to competitive majors, most students I work with apply to 12 to 20 colleges and I don't recommend more than 20 applications in general. When I say applications, you know, I have some students who apply to UCs, they apply to nine schools at once, they check nine boxes, they have to pay nine fees, which is kind of expensive. It's like, how much is that? It's like over $600 to apply to every UC. It gets expensive. But I count that as one application because it's only one thing you have to fill out. It's only one set of essays. But more than 20 applications just gets to be crazy town and your essays suffer and things don't look good. And at a certain point, you just need to narrow the field, figure out where you want to go, you know, and then figure out your plan B or your plan C. And maybe that's community college or whatever it is, but whittle it down. As you make your college list, you also might need to track cost comparisons. A good tool for that is the cost calculators that are on individual schools' websites. There are third-party apps or websites that will help you calculate approximate costs, including need-based aid at particular schools. But generally, the school itself is going to have the most accurate calculator. So I recommend that you try that if that's a piece of your decision-making process. Number five, explore your interests and find ways to grow outside the classroom. Though it's not required that you do extracurricular activities if you're applying to college, it's always a good idea to be involved in your community because that involvement can help make you a stronger candidate for college. Many colleges, though not all, are going to require you to write essays, and often your activities are a really good source of material for those essays to show things like leadership, excellence, etc. In particular, as you explore your interests, I want you to look for activities that do the following. One, that help you identify academic and career subjects that interest you. Exploring your academic and career interests is always a good move. Number two, that allow you to be a leader or a team contributor. 
being able to contribute to a team or being able to lead others are often qualities that schools are looking for. If you can tell stories about experiences that show that, that could be really good. And finally, that help you show your best qualities or your excellence. And that can vary from student to student. That could mean persistence, creativity, problem solving ability. Whatever helps you show your best self, those are good activities to engage in. Number six, my sixth step is to write your essays. I recommend that most students start writing their essays the summer before senior year. Now, many of you might say, but Brooke, the common application doesn't even open until August 1st. How in the world am I supposed to start writing my essays? before the application is open. Well, the common application has the same prompts basically every single year. And the way this application works, if you're not familiar with it, it's a general application that the majority of colleges and universities in the United States use to process applications. So you only have to fill it out once. And then for each college or university, you fill out little pieces of supplemental questions, sometimes supplemental essays or portfolios or other elements that you might upload that are specific to a particular program or college. What that means is you write one essay that you generally use at the majority of the colleges you are applying to. And that one essay that is the common application essay, again, the prompts repeat almost every year and there's always one that's choose your own prompt. So you can start on that personal statement during the summer before the application is open. If you want help with that process, we have lots of videos here on our channel and I teach a group class every summer as well as private coaching sessions with about 40 students per year. So if you're looking for coaching help, you can also head to Super Tutor TV and we'd be glad to help you out with that process. Number seven, figure out your EAED strategy. I know some of you are wondering what is ED and what is EA? Well, early action, early decision, restrictive early action, all of these things. We have another video that explains the difference between all of them and why they're really important tools in your college admissions journey if you're trying to get in particular into a competitive school or a reach school. When you apply early, you increase your chances of admission at many universities. So I recommend that you try to figure out that strategy, usually summer before your senior year or early early fall of your senior year. Next up is ask your teachers and counselor for letters of recommendation. Now counselors pretty much universally have to write something up for each of your college applications. So they're probably aware of that, but it's always good to check in with your counselor and see if you can help them in that process if they need any information from you. It's good to meet with your counselor to make sure that you're on top of everything and they have everything they need from you. Second, most colleges and universities are going to ask you to get two letters of recommendation from teachers. Now that number isn't the same at every college and university. Some colleges don't want any letters of rec like the University of California. So check with all of those colleges on your list. What are their policy for recommendation letters? But chances are, if you're applying to several colleges, at least one of them is going to want some letters of rec. So I recommend that you talk to your teachers at the beginning of senior year, and you're going to probably be going to your junior year teachers and asking them for those letters. Give them plenty of time. Do not tell them two days before the deadline at least two to three weeks, but ideally right at the beginning of the year, right as school gets back into session, that's a great time to ask your teachers. You can even ask them at the end of junior year if you want to be really ahead of the game. But ask a couple teachers. You can also, for some schools, have an outside recommender as a third letter. And again, that comes down to every individual school's policy. So see what you need, see what's available, and make sure you request those letters early on. Number nine is apply. So once August 1st hits, your applications are going to be open. It's time to start filling out that application. Make sure that somebody proofreads your activity section. I know a lot of people know that someone should proofread their essays, but sometimes people forget that your activities descriptions can also sometimes be unclear or confusing. So make sure that another set of eyes takes a look at those and helps you ensure that they look awesome. Additionally, you're going to have to fill out all of the other paperwork and forms. In addition to filling out your application, you also are going to want to probably apply for financial aid if that applies to you. There are two different forms that colleges use generally. One is called the CSS, which is a private company that does a financial snapshot and your parents probably have to help you fill this out as well. And the other is called the FAFSA. This year they rolled out a new FAFSA and the dates got all messed up. I don't know what the rollout is going to look like next fall, but generally keep your eyes open because those documents tend to open in the fall and then you can get those filled out as well. Number 10. Follow up with your counselor. So once you've kind of gotten your college applications in or as you start to get them in, follow up with your counselor. Make sure that he or she has sent your transcript and that you have sent any 
additional supplemental portfolios, information, et cetera, that might be necessary. For example, sometimes I have students and they need to send a separate transcript from the community college they took a course at, things like that. Make sure you tie up all those loose ends, send all the additional little pieces that you need. If a school happens to require official test reports from SAT or ACT, make sure you send those in. Most colleges don't require those, but if you do, just make sure you've got all those T's crossed and those I's dotted. Step 11, sign up for an interview and do an interview if available. Not all colleges offer interviews to prospective students, but if those interviews are offered, I almost universally tell students, unless they have some sort of crazy anxiety disorder, take the opportunity. Not only do interviews help a college get to know you, but they also help you get to know a college because you can sit there and ask someone who went to that school all about their experience, which is great. Finally, number 12, my last piece of advice is to keep engaged throughout the application season and throughout that senior year. After you apply and you ship your application in, as I like to say, it's not over till it's over. If you have an update in your transcript or grades and you feel like your grades have had an upward clip, it's totally cool for most universities to send them an updated transcript and let them know, hey, my grades have gone up. If you have activities updates, if you win a big debate award or something that you think would weigh positively in your application, send an email to the admissions office and say, hey, I just wanted to update you. Send a little quick email. And that can help you in the admissions process. Likewise, if you get deferred or you get waitlisted at some point in the college admissions cycle, I recommend that you check into whether that school will accept a letter of continuing interest or a Loki or some other update information. If so, I always recommend that students use the opportunity to write that Loki or update information to, again, share more of their successes and their activities and accomplishments. So during senior year, don't give up. Don't get major senioritis. Hang in there. Do your best. I've seen plenty of students get deferred or waitlisted, and because they knocked it out of the park senior year, because their grades went up, because they engaged in activities in ways they hadn't junior or sophomore year, even though they were late to the game. I've seen students like this get deferred or get waitlisted and then get off the waitlist or get off that deferred list and get into their dream schools. So I encourage you, if you feel like you're a late bloomer, it's not over till it's over. Keep trying all the way to the end of senior year. Do your best. And remember, you can always email colleges quick updates if you feel like it's relevant. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet because we have lots more tips on the entire process of applying to college. I hope you enjoyed this. Find us at supertutortv.com and I'll see you all later.